Okay. All right. Um, we we have three different kinds of chi squared tests. The two tests, the two chi squareds today, are computed and, for all intents and purposes, uh, the same mathematically uh, and everything. They are slightly different than what we computed on Wednesday, which was the chi squared goodness of fit. Um, you are going to have a quiz on Tuesday of next week and a test on Thursday of next week over all of these, this chapter. But you know that we will practice how to tell the difference between the, the various tests and understanding that, of course, that on Monday. We'll solidify that, okay? And so, here we go for the chi-squared test of homogeneity, which is going to be today. All right, so you guys know that homogeneity is implying, you know, meaning the same. So what we're interested in for chi-squared tests of homogene homogeneity, we are interested in testing to see if two or more groups, that's why it's different than just a hypothesis test of one proportion, have the same, hence homogeneity, distribution of counts, okay, for one categorical variable, like color in our M&Ms. Um, one example might be this, if you want to compare three groups of the senior adults, the middle-aged adults, and the young adults across this variable here of drinking milk or not drinking milk, are they drinking milk at the same rate? That would be your question there. But something that actually makes more of a connection to what we did Wednesday is this. If we wanted to talk about all three of those types of M&Ms that we had on Wednesday, the peanut butter, the peanut, and the regular M&Ms, and instead of checking the rates of what the M&M's company says, we're just going to compare them to each other. That's this test. So, for example, if we had peanut butter and peanut M&M's and the regular M&M's, and we were going to compare them for one categorical variable, meaning the red, the orange, the blue, green, yellow, and brown, so that's our one category for three groups and see if they have those colors at the same rate. So, of course, our null hypothesis is that they are, they have the distribution of colors at the same rate. Then we get a sample and we see if we have evidence to the contrary. Um, now, I want to sit on this for a second and kind of reference your, what you did on Wednesday. <coughs> What you did on Wednesday was you picked one of these kinds. Say you picked the peanut butter type of M&Ms. Then you were finding out if it was the same as what the M&M company claimed. So you were going, comparing to a claimed number. On Wednesday, you essentially could have taken your sample and compared it to what the M&M company uh, claimed so that's one proportion against a claimed number. Then would we do, if I was just doing this for red, I would just be comparing one proportion to the claimed number. That would be a confident or a hypothesis test for one proportion. Okay. So, but we would have to do that for six different colors. And so hence we would have six different one proportion Z tests. Okay, so we don't want to do that. I think I might have even said on Wednesday multiple t-tests, but that would have been wrong because that's about averages and not proportions. So this would be multiple z-scores, okay? So that's what Wednesday was about, was essentially multiple one-proportion tests. But watch this. Today, we are comparing more than one group. Say we're comparing two groups. Say I'm wondering if the proportion of red for peanut butter is the same as the proportion of red for peanut M&Ms. What kind of test would just that be for reds? Yeah, that would be a hypothesis test for two proportions if I just did this for reds. But because I want to do this for multiple colors, 
and I have multiple two proportion Z tests, then I will be doing the chi-squared test of homogeneity. And um, the other benefit to the chi-squared test of homogeneity is that I can also do it for more than two groups. I can do it for three as well. <clears throat> so that's what's happening. Now, whenever we would do just one group, we would have the conditions for just one group. If I'm going to do the conditions for two groups, then what added condition am I going to have to have about the groups? They are independent of each other. Remember when we had two proportions, I had to say the members of this group are independent of the members of this group. Same thing here. Because the peanut butter M&Ms are not going to be counted in the peanut group now, so then let's look at these conditions. They are all the same as what we did on Wednesday with the chi-squared goodness of fit, with the exception of having to say that the groups are independent of each other. And again, that's because we've got three groups instead of just one. Okay? I think that makes sense. All right, and then... But because we have three groups instead of just one, on Wednesday, our degrees of freedom came from what? What was our degrees of freedom for one set of, one package of M&Ms, one type, categories minus one? So in this case, rows minus one is six minus one, so it was five, okay? But because we have multiple groups, then we also have columns minus one, which is three columns of groups minus one, so that's two. So therefore, when you have this multiple comparisons going on, our degrees of freedom in this case would be ten. Five times the two. Rows minus one times columns minus one. Okay? So that's the only thing's different. Now we do put it in the, different, in the calculator differently. <clears throat> and you can see down here I list all of these calculator steps so that in a little bit, whenever we get ready to do those, you can do them in your calculator and you still have them written here so that you don't have to write those steps out yourself. <clears throat> so let's go to a problem. Here we go. <clears throat> I know you're going to like this picture and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. Okay. So. Here we go. It is common folk wisdom that drinking cranberry juice can help prevent urinary tract infections in women. Uh, in 2001, the British Medical Journal reported the results of a Finnish study in which three groups of 50 women drank, or they were monitored, sorry, for these infections for a six-month period. One group drank cranberry juice daily. Another group drank a lactobacillus drink daily. Okay, so that's why I have this picture because most people say, what is a lactobacillus drink? Do you remember this thing, Yakult, this little bitty thing? It's kind of like a Danimals, but it, pro it has more live probiotics or whatever. Okay, so it's supposed to help with your digestion and your uh, regularity, I guess, okay? So there you go. That's, that's that picture. That's the lactobacillus type thing we're talking about. And uh, then a third group drank neither, did not drink cranberry juice nor this lactobacillus drink every day for those six months. And so then the, in the, um, do, 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 do. Oh, then they are going to be monitored for the, num the, if they drink, if they got a urinary tract infection or not, at least one urinary tract infection in those six months. Um, just a little side note. If we were talking about how many urinary tract infections they got, that would be referencing an average. Because you would average how many this group got and average how many that group got, and that is not chi-squared. Chi-squared would be the proportion that got an, a urinary tract, tract infection and the proportion that did not. Okay, so it has to be proportion. Chi-squared has to be proportion. Um, and just one other quick thing, on your warm-up that you had last night, you s I put this here on purpose because, you know, in my overwhelming ability to get all, grasp all this stuff the first year that I taught it, I didn't even notice that little 
important fact. And I had made this problem about the weights of the candy. Well, that is not okay because weight is a quantitative amount. Average speed, average distance, average time. Okay, those kinds of things that average are not chi squares. Only proportion amounts. Categorical data, the proportion of counts can be chi squared. Okay. So hence, whenever we talk about this right here, we're talking about the proportion that develops at least one a urinary tract infection during that six months. Yes. Are urinary tract infections I don't know. I, I, don't, I think these numbers are high. Uh, I think they should be like out of groups of 500 or something instead of out of just 50. But um, maybe these were women that had already been uh, experiencing frequency of those issues, okay? So I don't know. But I don't think so. I think in general, uh, yeah, it's not, not that common. All right. So the question is this. Does this study provide supporting evidence for the value of cranberry juice warding off urinary tract infections? Okay, now, let me tell you this little teaching thing to these sets of notes. First of all, if I was just going to be talking about cran the cranberry juice group, you know, I would probably compare it to the control. And if I was going to do that, I would just do a two proportion Z test. Okay? But for teaching purposes of the chi squared, I want to do more than two groups. So for teaching purposes today, I am going to talk about all th three groups and if they have the um, infection at the same rate. And if I find that they don't have it at the same rate, then I'm going to go look at something else that I'm going to teach you about to t talk specifically about the cranberry juice. Okay. So, under normal circumstances, if you read this question, you would just go, okay, I'm just going to compare cranberry juice to control. All right, but we're not. We're going to do all three at a time for the teaching purpose of it. So, the hypothesis statement is going to be that all three groups of women that take these treatments get a urinary tract infection, and I'm going to abbreviate that, <clears throat> at the what would be the one for the, yes, same rate. Hence, chi-squared test of homogeneity. Okay. So then our alternative is that same thing. All three groups of women with these treatments get a UTI at what? At a different rate. Now notice that you cannot do um, tail direction on this. I'm not saying less than or greater than. Later, whenever I show you one other component of this, we will be able to address the, the direction of warding off them and having less happen with the cranberry juice, okay? <clears throat> All right. So now let's go to our assumptions. What's our first one? Okay, random. Now, keep in mind, how many groups do I have here? Three. So just like when we have two means or two proportions and we have to do conditions for two, here we're having to do the conditions for all three. So you will need to address all three here. So how do you want to say that on this random? It is not stated at all. Okay. So when we assume, what are you assuming? We're not assuming random. We're actually assuming that all three groups are representative of their respective populations. I like that, respective populations. That's a good way of kind of getting past some of the details. Just like whenever I say, of all such adults or whatever, that kind of blumps some of the details in there. Assume that all three groups are representative 
because we have three populations of their respective populations, the population <coughs> of each treatment group. Uh, by the way, is the design of this an observational study or an experiment, and why? <coughs> why is an experiment? Okay, well now I have an observational study. Why is it an observational study? Why, why do you say we can't draw cause and effect? What allows you to draw cause and effect? <coughs> ah, review from the beginning of the year. Guess what? If you have a controlled experiment where you randomly assign these women to groups and assign them a treatment, so I have 50, I have 150 women. I'm going to randomly assign 50 of them to the cranberry juice treatment group. And I'm going to assign 50 to the lactobacillus treatment group. And I'm going to assign 50 to the don't drink either of these things group and have them serve as the control. So you want to revise your answer? This is an experiment because I am assigning a treatment. So in essence, <clears throat> Did you so totally say that? Okay. Thank you. At least you need to just speak up. So this is an experiment. All right. Let's go to the next thing. Independent. Okay. What's our deal for independent? Okay. And it's going to be annoying because I have to do it for all three groups. So, I don't write anything yet. Technically, yeah, technically I should be going 50 is less than 10% of all women in cranberry juice uh, treatment. And then I would do it for the other ones. 50 is less than 10% of all women. Uh, that do the lactobacillus treatment. And then the same thing for the control group. But I don't even want to have to do that. And because they actually all have 50, then I can I kind of have a luxury there of being able to state them all at once and say of all their respective populations. So let's just do that. If these had been different numbers, then the bummer thing is that you would have to write them out separately. So... Set up. Let's go back here and make this short. 50 is less than 10% of um, all women in the <coughs> prospective populations I need to put somewhere in there for all three groups because that for all three groups because I have to indicate that I am shortcutting this and not writing it out three times okay because I have three groups all right what else uh, large enough is not yet ready yes all three groups are independent of each other. Okay. So now we go to large enough. <coughs> and what, what what's the qualities for our large enough? What has to happen? They have to be greater than five. What's they? They is too generic. What's they? Expected counts are greater than five. And this is not okay to just say this like this. You had to prove it, meaning <clears throat> show it somewhere. So we're going to have to do that. So let's go down here <clears throat> to these things and fill out these tables. We have one for observed data. 
and we have one for expected data. And after we figure these out, in a second, I'm going to be able to put in my conditions as shown in the table below. Okay, so we're going to check and see if these expected are greater than 5. Okay, <clears throat> now, from the paragraph above, I know that 8 um, ended up having a urinary tract infection out of the 50, which makes 42 of them did not get a urinary tract infection. 20 of the lactobacillus group of the 50 had a urinary tract infection, so 30 did not. And for the control group, 18 out of the 50 had a urinary tract infection, so 32 did not. I also want to total up these rows because it, we're going to use those computations for something else. 46 and 104, we do have a grand total of the population. <coughs> I'm sorry, of all the samples of 150. Now, <coughs> I would like to talk to you about how to get this expected value. You know, Wednesday, when we got our expected value, it's because the m and company told us what proportion the, th the color should be happening at. Okay, here, they should be happening at the same rate. So, what ends up happening is, and I have it on your first page, Here's how you can compute this by hand. You can compute the expected counts by taking the row total, multiplying the column total, and then dividing by, for lack of a better word, the total total, okay? All right. So let's do that for each one of these cells. So let's do this cell here. Let's find what this is expected to be if everything was happening at the same rate. So, let's, let's do the row total, which is 46 times the column total, which is 50, divided by the total total of 150. That gives us 15.3. Okay, so that's the rate that they would be happening at, okay? And then, of course, you can get this one by subtracting 15.3 from 50. This is a, a repeated value, by the way. And you get 34.6 repeating. You also could have gotten that number by doing 104 times 50 divided by 150. Okay. And do you see that's happening? Because the 46 that got the, got the uh, urinary tract infection were one-third of the total in that case. Now, because this sample size is the same across the board, these numbers also are the same across the board. That does not happen all the time. If this was a different number, then these would also be different values because they would be a different proportion of the total, FYI. All right, so let's fill those in. Okay, so question, look at all these expected values. Are they all greater than five? They are. So then I can say to my reader, <clears throat> as shown in the table below. you got to prove it. You can't just have them say, you know, I checked it. Come on, they're all greater than five. Or eh, they seem big enough like they're going to be greater than five. Okay, no. You have to prove your case. So that's correct. We summarize and we say that our chi-squared model applies. <clears throat> what test will be used? The chi-squared test of homogeneity. All right. And so now we're going to get the statistic and other pertinent information, our p-value, our degrees of freedom, and we are going to use a calculator for that. I don't actually even know if I know how to do it by hand. I, I think it's one of those ones where it's like crazy weird computation, so we just let the calculator do it for us. So here we go. We have to put our information in a matrix because it's in the format of a matrix with multiple rows and columns. 
So go second x to the negative 1. And then you have all these matrix options. Okay, you can do this. And so you need to edit to put your information in. So go over to edit. And by the way, all of these are on the front of your notes in case you get there Saturday, Sunday night and can't remember these steps, okay? So enter into that. If you have your own calculator, this is probably blank and you don't have anything. This is rows by columns. So I, a lot of times, can't remember that. I just enter these numbers 2 by 3 or 3 by 2 until the shape of the matrix is the shape that I need it to be, okay? And so then enter in your observed values into matrix A. So look at your thing, look at what you got here, and put in your observed values here into your matrix. Okay, do you remember how Wednesday we had to put observed into list one, and what did we put into list two? We put expected. And that's because the m and company told us what to expect. But here, nobody's telling us what to expect. We're checking to see if they're the same, and therefore they are formula-based, <clears throat> hence this row times column over the total. So we let the calculator, it can do the expected for us. We don't even have to put in a matrix B. It can compute it for us. <clears throat> so what we get to now, go straight away and run the test. So we're going to go stat over to test. Go up to chi-squared and hit enter. So the observed is in matrix A. Now, you're welcome to make a matrix B with the expected, but you don't have to. It's formula-based. It's not relying on what somebody tells it to do. So we can just, it will paste. It will make up the expected and it will put paste it in there for you. So that's all good. Calculate. And there's our pertinent information. <clears throat> chi squared value is 7.78, <clears throat> the p value is 0 0.02, and the degrees of freedom is 2. Uh, by the way, what proof as to why this degrees of freedom is 2? Rows minus 1, sorry you don't, oh well, you're going to get it. Rows minus 1 times column minus 1, we have uh, 2 rows. So that's one. We had three columns, so that's two. So one times two is two, hence degrees of freedom two. Rows minus one times columns minus one. Okay. So ta-da. One last thing before we go on to our little um, conclusion is this. If you did not want to do all of this by hand, Sometimes it's easier to do it by hand because sometimes a multiple choice question might just ask you, what's the expected urinary tract infection uh, counts for cranberry? Okay, maybe they just ask you one and you don't want to go have to run a whole test. But if you need the whole thing, you can view the matrix B by going to matrix. It is most easily viewed as if you are going to edit it. So go edit, go down to number two, and voila, there is the expected matrix that the calculator computed on its own, okay? So again, you don't have to do it by hand, but it's good to know that computation by hand anyway. All right, so we are to this place where we can now... Um, make a decision and compare to alpha. So our p-value of 0.02 is less than our alpha of 0.05, so our decision is to reject the null hypothesis and let's make a conclusion. Since the p-value is low, The null hypothesis has to go. I reject that. What am I rejecting? No, I'm 
not rejecting that. I'm rejecting, okay, that all three groups of women, this is the statement of the null hypothesis, get urinary tract infections at the same rate. Okay. Now, at this time, I would go look at the question and make sure I answer this specific question, which the specific question is this. Does this study provide supporting evidence for the value of cranberry juice in warding off urinary tract infections? I have not uh, shown you how you can specifically look at the cranberry juice component. And so I'm going to do that now. Yes. Did you categorize this as A, B, C, D, E, F, G, model? No, this is a chi squared of homogeneity model. All right. So, turn the next page and you see this. We're going to skip this until Monday. Yes. Um, what stops a person from below the setting alpha at, like, for example, 0 0.01 on this problem? Because that would... Because then that would change it. Right. So just... Right. Um, okay. So, the definition of what you want alpha to be was probably going to depend on um, error probabilities. Is a type 1 error worse? Should I make alpha larger or smaller to kind of <clears throat> handle that problem than this problem? Okay. So uh, a person going into this study would probably think about that error situation and decide which alpha then that they want to control if they need to control it more than just having the standard default. Okay. All right. <coughs> You actually have this next in your notes, but we're going to hold off on that because it's just like too much information. We're already kind of reaching that that threshold. So, let's kind of summarize what we've done so far. In summary, we had three groups. We ran a chi-squared test to determine if they were having something happen at the same rate. Okay. And we talked about the... Uh, conditions. We talked about putting this into your calculator, how to do this expected value for a matrix, and how to get it in your calculator. Okay, so that's what we've done so far. So now, because the question actually specifically asks about cranberry juice, I want to be able to look at a comp that component individually. So, the next phase of this is to um, give you details about each component individually. And we are going to do that with a standardized residual matrix. So here we go. If you reject the null hypothesis, then you're probably going to wonder something specifically, like which item is contributing most to the chi-squared value? Which one is most is farthest away from expected, okay? And we can do that with a standardized residual. I want to remind you what a residual is. We did that probably back in November where we would have a prediction line and then we had some actual data and then what kind of, what of this picture is the residual? Not the line. The line is predicted. Where's the residual? Yes, thank you. How close, how far away the dots are, what actually happened compared to what was predicted. Do you remember that the residual was actual minus predicted? So in this case, we would have a positive residual because the actual was above predicted. And in this case, we would have a negative residual because the actual was below predicted. Now, let me kind of make a connection here. Would actual not be considered what we observe? And would predicted not be what was or what is expected? Okay. So, what I want to do 
is reference this, what's observed minus expected. And instead of putting it in terms of like a standard deviation, because we don't really have a standard deviation measurement, we, we put it in terms of this uh, component that's the square root of expected. I'm going to show you why it's that here in a second. On Wednesday, remember at the end of our M&M's line, we had all these different components. And what did we do at the end of all those components? We added them up to get pi squared. We needed to make sure that all of these things were not what? Negative. We wanted to not have negatives, so that's why we had observed minus expected quantity squared over expected. This came from this formula here. It's the square of it, okay, essentially. Um, what benefit do we have in examining the residuals with this formula as opposed to the formula we used for components on Wednesday. What can this do for us that the other formula cannot? Perfect. This will indicate the direction and the sign, if it was above expected or if it was below expected. Perfect. And so here is how we create a standardized residual matrix. We want to do this for each category here. So I'm going to do this one. If you look on the previous page, our observed UTI was 8 minus the expected cranberry UTIs. What was expected? 15.3 divided by the square root of expected. So that value is negative 1.87. So, of course, I can see this is below expected. Duh, I could see that actually from, you know, looking at the two matrix matrices themselves. But what we're going to get to do is we're going to get to uh, have something better than, than all that information. I'll talk about it in a second. I want you to finish. Let's do a couple uh, calculations for you. Will you do the residual, standardized residual for the top line? Finish off the top line from standard, uh, standardized residual. So 20 minus 15.3 divided by the 15, square root of 15.3. Okay, so do that calculation real quick so we can finish that off and then talk about it. That means the farthest distance away from zero in either direction. That one I'm interested in. So the cranberry juice. So this is kind of giving me evidence that this is contributing most to the chi-squared. It's the one that's most different. So that's why it's very significant, something for me to notate. So what type of conclusion could we make? Well, we actually can make the conclusion that it asks us about on our statement here, which the statement is, does this study provide supporting evidence for the value of cranberry juice in warding off urinary tract infections? And so what I can say is this, oops, right here. As evidence by 
the standardized residual of negative 1.87 Okay, and then I've got, then I kind of can answer the question. Then I can say this study does provide supporting evidence. So I'm just really kind of restating the question now with an answer. the value of cranberry juice in warding off <clears throat> urinary tract infections. And so because you know that this negative residual means that it's having infections less than infected. Okay, that's it. So let me summarize again. We found there was a significant drift difference by having of the infection rate by running a chi-squared test. And then we looked at the standardized residuals to see which component is most significant and in which direction. Now, on your homework, I only want you to do the first page. Okay, so only this pool number 11, just the first page about this uh, crew and the total dead and alive and all that kind of stuff. All right, so that's it. Now, yes. So, say you got that same exact negative 1.87, but that 